Amen. 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 Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's invite the Lord to continue to move in this. Lord, right now, we thank you for your name. Whether it's whispered or shouted or cried or considered, we thank you for the name of Jesus. The name of all names. The name under which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. We pray Jesus over our community. Jesus over our family. Jesus over those watching with us online. Jesus for those right next to us in this moment. Lord, may you just show up and do what only you could do. May you minister to places that we need your word and truth like we never have before. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. You may grab a seat. I'm going to ask you all to open those doors. Thank you. Every summer, at the beginning of the summer, we find out we have a new challenge with the air conditioner. We're going to get these doors open so we can get some airflow, but we're going to let God uh, meet us in this moment. I, this year it's cooling. Last couple of years it's been belts, and so we got the belt system fixed up, and the moment that happened, uh, now we found out. Anybody else find out this, this week you had an AC issue at the house? Horrible timing, right? So anyway, just want you to know we, we pay the bills. Everything's okay. We're not trying to turn up the temperature to make you consider heaven versus hell or anything like that. This is just coolant, and it'll be fixed by next week. Hey, before we start the message, can I actually just share with you kind of a, uh, uh, just a, a few minutes of just appetizer, if you would. Is that okay? Um, we're doing this weekend the Hampton Opportunities uh, Book Fair, and the reason we do that is because uh, there is a direct correlation between child illiteracy and adult incarceration. Uh, if you want more information on that, you can study the, the Cradle to Prison Pipeline, which was conducted in, the, I think, the 80s, updated in 2007. Um, there's a lot to talk about in terms of the challenges communities face, the challenges our community is facing. Uh, can I just invite you to a reality that there is a generation of kids going to public schools in our city right now who were at home trying to learn how to read and write for the past, for two years through a screen? And teachers trying to help them figure that out through a screen. We had a, a literacy issue in our country before the pandemic. It has been exasperated. If I could give you a tangible expression of this, this past Thursday, no, I don't even know, it was this past week, I had the opportunity to go to court on behalf of a friend who's getting his rights restored. He's got a pass like all of us. We all have a pass. Some of us just got caught and didn't get caught, right? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> So he is, he is in the process of, so he had a petition to get his rights restored. He has served his time. He's done his thing. He's changed his life. Jesus has transformed him. And I watched my friend stand up in front of the judge as the judge was honoring and celebrating how big of a difference he's seen in his life. And the first thing he said was, I just got to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's like, he's like that's, that's awesome, right? I noticed something during that exchange. Uh, I sat in court as a character witness for him, and I was waiting, and, and there was about six or seven cases on the docket, and there was different people there for different reasons. There were two people, that, and the judge was so humane and so polite, and he, and he said the same things to every person, which I thought was awesome. He said, hey, have you felt adequately uh, helped by your lawyer? Yes, Your Honor. Are you capable of easily reading and writing the, the documents that were given to you? And do you understand them? Yes, Your Honor. Have you had all your questions answered? Because a lot of these people were in there on a plea bargain, and they're trying to stand before the court to, to plea for sentencing. And uh, yes, Your Honor. D has your lawyer done anything that you did not ask? That, or has your lawyer not done anything that you asked of them? No, Your Honor. Has anyone threatened you? No, Your Honor. Has anybody made you promises that, that are not included in the documentation that I'm asking you to sign? No, Your Honor. And, and he would walk through, and then he would ask them, uh, this this is what I understand about your story. And then he would ask him this question. What's your highest level of education? I watched about six cases before my friend came up for his petition, which, praise God, he got his rights restored. That's awesome. Praise God. Yeah, the story of redemption. But what stood out to me, if I could just briefly share with you, was there were two cases uh, in, that came before the, the, the judge for felony charges. One was a man in his 60s. One was a young man who was 23 years old. Both of them were up for felony charges that they were trying to plead down. One of them had 16, uh, 16 charges that were plead down to five. 
One was in prison, showed up, released from prison so he could attend circuit court on a separate charge that he got while he was out of prison, but now he's back in prison. This is what stood out to me as the judge asked every person the same questions. These two gentlemen answered this question in a way that stood out from different than everybody else that stood before the judge. He asked the older gentleman, what's your highest level of education? And he said, the fifth grade. He said, I remember that because I remember the day my dad said, you're not going to school today. You're going to work with me. We've got to feed this family. And the young man, the 20-something-year-old young man, he asked him his highest level of education. He said, ninth grade. And by that point, he had been incarcerated. And I watched and I thought about everything we talk about. And a lot of people post about stuff. We all get animated about things. We all ask ourselves, you know, what? something we got to do, something's got to change, something's not right. I'm telling you right now, there is a direct correlation between third grade illiteracy and future incarceration. We have partnered with three public schools who have an imagination to equip the children that attend that school with a dream of the ability to read on grade level and to actually begin a library. That is the sole exclusive reason that we have the Hampton Opportunities Initiative book fair today is so that we can buy those books so those kids can get that book fair set up at their school and they can walk through and make a decision about which books they would like so that they can join their school in the summer reading initiative that their school created because because we said, if you create the program, we will resource it. These kids are going to be able to walk into the Scholastic Book Fair, not worried about whether they have money to pay for a book or not, because there was a church that loved them enough to bless them with a book. And then they get to start their own library. If you visit my house, I got books in every room. We have more books than my wife would like to have in our house. I have books in the living room, books in the office, books in the bathroom, books in the, anywhere. My mom's here today. This is my mama right here. My brother will tell you this. My brother would tell you that when we went to the Scholastic Book Fair as kids, remember mom, we'd come home with a little list and we'd check all the boxes and it didn't matter how much it was. My mom made sure we could go in there and get every single thing we wanted. She put an imagination in us as kids. Now I understand everyone doesn't start there. Maybe you didn't start there, but today you can be a part of starting that dream for somebody else. And that's all I'm going to say about that. We got a lot of books. After service is the most air-conditioned spot in the church. Run down there and spend some time sowing into these kids. You know, people talk about the gospel. People talk about the gospel. We do a lot for the gospel. We try to help people get off the streets that are in homelessness. We, do, we try to help people get off of drugs. We try to help people find Jesus. We try to help people who don't think they need anything realize they need Jesus. But I'm telling you, the gospel looks a lot of different ways, but light shines in the darkness, and the darkness won't overcome it. It doesn't have to be politicized. It doesn't have to be monetized. When the church does something to meet the needs of the community, the community stops and takes notice that there is something different about these people. And in the words of Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> now, let me pray, and then we're going to get into this message. God, right now, we just ask that you open our hearts to your word. God, would you just show us exactly what it is you're trying to deposit into us through a study of your truth. I pray specifically, God, against shame. I pray, Lord God, that for those of us who fall in line to the, to the belief that, that we have to live under a cloud of shame, Lord, I know that the struggle is real, but I know that your truth is more real. And so I just ask you to step into this moment with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been going in this series, The Struggle is Real, and the topic of this week is shame. We call it shame and guilt, but I realized something. Guilt is an emotion. Guilt is like something that all of us, like there's a measure of guilt that's normal and healthy, right? Like if I, if I stole a cookie, I should feel guilty. I did something that I knew I shouldn't have done. The problem is when guilt goes from being emotional an experience to a state of being, and that turns into a lifestyle of shame. I did something wrong, and now I have to live under this cloud of shame. That is not God's design for his children. And the tension with that is that often we don't realize necessarily who we are or we don't, maybe we've been in a, in a, in a church or in a situation that has used shame to try to cultivate a fear relationship with God or a fear response to God. And that, the problem with that is the cross. The problem with that is the Bible. I heard somebody say once, fear is a, uh, a great motivator but a horrible compass. 
And it has saddened me because I think if you've been a part of the American church, if you've been around enough, you probably have been exposed to environments that try to use the fear of God to somehow lead you to repentance. The Bible says it is the goodness of God which leads to repentance. And I think sometimes we just don't understand what we don't understand. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I, we had a staycation, so we were here with the kids and hanging out. We went to my buddy's Kentucky Derby party. Has anybody heard of these things? You get all dressed up like you're going to the Kentucky. So I had to get an outfit, and we went, and, and I, I know nothing about horses or anything like that, but for two days a year, I become a horse expert. I read everything I could read about the horses. Long story short, I thought I knew it. he does all this stuff for charity. It's a really cool uh, thing that he does to uh, raise money for, for an organization that helps uh, veterans. That is, Every 22 seconds, a veteran in our country commits suicide. And so he throws this huge party and raises a ton of money to help this cause. So we're there. So I'm learning all about these horse, horse, horses and all this stuff. And I know all the horses. I'm telling my wife, this horse, that, that horse, this. And all of a sudden, they go, talk about a horse I've never even heard of. The horse's name is Rich Strike. Did anybody catch the story of the Kentucky Derby? It's crazy. This horse was not supposed to be in the race. It only entered the race because an owner decided to pull his horse out of the race. It was an alternate. This horse had odds against it that were 80 to 1. There are 20 horses in the race. And there was an 80 to 1 chance that this horse could race or could win. That means that they thought the rest of the horses were at least four times better than this horse. But the horse didn't know that. All the horse knew was it was built for something. It was trained for something. And when the gate opened, it ran for something. I actually have a picture of how the Kentucky Derby ended in case you missed it. I don't know if you could see the number on the back of that horse, but it's number 21 out of 20. This is a picture of Rich Strike the 80 to 1 underdog winning the Kentucky Derby. Here's the problem. It won the race. Number one, winner's circle. But it hadn't raced very much. And after it won, it wanted to keep running. You can Google this. They had to send out a pony with a, a guy to try to stop the horse because it had already won, but it was still trying to give its best effort to something that was already done. And so, so someone comes up to it to try to stop it, and it bites the horse. And then it bit the guy riding the horse. And everyone's, there's a lot of controversy now about all, how all this is handled, but here's the thing. It had already won. It just didn't know how to act like a winner. And I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to go to the word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. It's already done. The old is gone and the new is here. All this is from who? From God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And then he gave us the ministry of being in the winner's circle. The ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. I want to say that again. Not counting people's sins against them. Not counting people's status as the underdog in life against them. Because a champion showed up for us and he ran the race he had prepared for from the foundation of the earth. He finished the race and he invites us to take his spot in the winner's circle. Sometimes we just don't know how to act. Jesus ran the race for us. We show up and we think, I somehow got to keep striving and keep running to somehow find this victory. And Jesus says, the race is finished. It's already won. Our issue is we just need to learn how to act like we belong in the winner's circle. Right? But it's all, we, we're there. We just need to understand it. This is what the, the message is. And, and he is committed to us. The message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, that we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, I love this. God made him who had no sin. Who is the only one who had no sin? God made Jesus 
to be sin for us so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. We might become the winners of the race. Jesus steps into our space. He accomplishes what you and I could not so that we might be able to stand with him in victory. This is the message of the Bible. This is specifically the message of the epistles and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, and, and the, the writings of the epistles, and, and, and the revelation of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is letting us know our identity in Christ. That's why we're doing this series, The Struggle is Real, because the struggle is real, but our God is more real. Now, the problem with the Bible is we could take this Bible and we could try to read it like a rule book, like an instruction manual of morality. Like, okay, if I do this and I do this and I do this, then I get to the winner's circle. You may or may not realize, but you, you, you might have been exposed to that theology coming up. I know I was. I remember going to a church, and I, it only took one sermon about hell and heaven when I was a teenager. It took one sermon at church camp about hell and heaven and that Jesus died so that I could get to heaven for me to say yes to I don't want to go to hell. It took me years to learn what it's like to live like someone in the winter circle. I always tease that, that one sermon— let, I let Jesus be my Savior in one sermon. It took about three or four years of discipleship for me to let him be king. And I, in the particular church I was in down in South Texas, it was, it was, it was kind of rooted in that mindset of like get right or get left. There was an undercurrent of legalism, an undercurrent of like you better watch yourself. You better pay your tithes or God's going to pop your tires. I heard that from the pulpit. I'm sure well-intentioned, well-meaning, loving people, but it's taking New Testament believers and putting them under an Old Testament covenant. And the problem with that is the cross. In order to try to teach New Testament believers Old Covenant law, you have to look past the cross of Jesus. Because my Bible says, and we read it together, that he finished the work. That he is now no longer counting men's sins against them. He paid for them. It's finished. The account has been reconciled. Anybody ever reconcile an account? The point of reconciliation is zero balance. Look at your neighbor and say, there's a zero balance. So then what's the point? If that's true, well then heck, why are we here on a Sunday morning in a hot, warm room? We could be at the beach. What's wrong with you people? You're crazy. Because when God affects your life, you realize there's so much more. The message of Jesus is not, hey, you can say this prayer so one day you get to heaven. The message of Jesus was you can begin this relationship so heaven can begin invading every part of your life right now. And so he gives us not an instruction manual, but if you look at the Gospels, if you look at the epistles, if you study the New Testament, what you're going to realize is it is not an instruction manual of do this and don't do that, do this and don't do that because you're trying to get yourself to the finish line. It is a reading of a will of inheritance. It is, hey, here is what has been given to you and this is how it should affect your life. You're in the winning circle. The New Testament is saying you're already a winner. Let's act like it. And those are very subtle but very different journeys. One is I'm trying to get there. The other was I'm already there. I should figure out how to represent the family. One is a path of shaming you to trying to change you. The problem is when the shame wears off, so does the purity. If you read 1 Corinthians, Paul deals a lot with sexual sin because it was a hypersexualized culture. Much like what we experience in today in America, right? I mean, it was, it was. And there was all kinds of confusion. There were people who were worshiping fertility gods with prostitutes at the temple. I mean, it, was, it was depraved before the gospel showed up. So Paul spends a lot of time writing about sexual sin because they were inundated with it. And they needed instruction and understanding of how to separate themselves from the way they thought was worship to what is true worship. But the point wasn't sexual immorality. The point was purity because of what's inside of you. If, if my purity is based on me getting yelled at, as soon as I stop being scared, I'm going to go back to what I was doing. But if my purity is based on something that's inside of me, 
I, I remember the saying, hey, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. The problem with that is on Saturday night, I'm just a sinner on Sunday morning, I'm saved by grace. Hey, we're just sinners, let's do what sinners do. But we'll be at the altar on our face crying because we need grace. From skanktified on Saturday to sanctified on Sunday, right? Preacher, you better preach, preach against sin, preach against sin to get me back to the altar. I need you to preach some tears into my life, preacher. The problem is when the shame wears off, so does the purity. But when I realize what Jesus has done for me and what he has put inside of me, it's not a license to sin. It's freedom from sin. It's genuine freedom because I'm changed from the inside out. It's not behavior modification. It's internal transformation. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at a few scriptures very rapidly. Romans chapter 8. I'll, I'm just going to read verse 1. You can read the rest later if you'd like. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The issue isn't the truth. The issue is how much of the truth we understand. John chapter 8 verse 32. John chapter 8 verse 32. Jesus said these words. Then you will know the truth and what? And the truth will set you free. It's possible to be saved but still have some places where I'm not free. In fact, if you're a note taker, you can jot that down. Let's write that. What's the first point? We are saved by grace, but set free by truth. Saved by grace, the grace of God. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Name a song. Pick a song. We got tons of songs about it, right? But freedom comes from understanding truth. So I can be delivered from sin, but I can still be bound by it because I think somehow I'm programmed for it. I was, the, according to the Bible, I was a sinner, but I've been saved by grace. And we read it in 2 Corinthians. Now I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I was a sinner, but I've been saved by grace. The moment you say yes to Jesus, who you are changed. That's why the Bible says the new creation has come. You say, well, yeah, but Freddie, I still struggle with, with bad thoughts. Well, that's where we need to learn to apply the truth instead of the lie. I still struggle with habits. Hey, so do I. There are places in my life where I have to take what was deposited in me and apply it to different areas of my life. I have a um, paint can here, and the reason I do is because uh, this is an image for us. This is going to be an image for us of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, and then I'm going to talk about the temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Y'all with me? Okay. Online, are you with me? Cool. No, I, we don't have that kind of technology. I didn't hear you say anything. Uh, he says, look at what he's writing to the Corinthian church again. We read from 2 Corinthians. Now he, this is the first letter he wrote to that church that was in that society. He said, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is what? In you. Who you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Do you see the order of the conversation? It doesn't say honor God with your bodies and then maybe you will become a temple of the Holy Spirit. The order is not if you do, you get. The order is you already got, so you should do. Morality matters because it's what our family looks like. You're already at the family table, but this is how the family conducts itself at the table. This is the message of the New Testament. It's not get right or get left. It's you already got, so, so let the world see it. This paint can, is, is it fair to say that this paint is in the room? This paint is in the room. The Holy Spirit is in us, correct? It's in here. But I don't know if you noticed or not. I don't know what color we got here. We got um, primer. <laughs> this message is not sponsored by anybody, so we're going to turn it that way. There's a process of applying what's in here to this room. Here's what's fascinating about the process. As I choose to apply what's in here to the room, all of a sudden, you can't talk about the paint being in the room. You talk about the paint being on the room. 
And there comes a point when all this paint, it gets expressed, it gets applied. You can't talk about the room without understanding the paint. And then there comes a point where you don't talk about the paint and the room separately because they have become one. There was something that was put in, but it's been applied, and now all of a sudden you can't talk about the room without noticing the paint. This is the power of understanding that the Spirit of God has already been placed inside of you the moment you said yes to Jesus. I just got to take that truth and apply it to how I talk. I got to take that truth and apply it to, to where I go. I got to take that truth and get a new hairline. No, that's not. I, I got to choose to apply that to my past, where I've been. I got to apply that truth to how I see things. I've got to take what's already there. It's not shame that sets me free. It's applying what has already been deposited inside of me to different areas of my life. Sometimes we can read this and miss the most significant part of this. So I want to be crystal clear for you. He said, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Corinthian church was in a place called Corinth, which was in a, a country called Greece, okay? Greece was, was one of the most, most expressive uh, spaces of Hellenistic culture, of ancient Greek culture, where basically it was hedonism. It was, hey, do what feels good. They would have parties where they would eat and they would have buckets because they would indulge themselves so much that they would sick. They would get sick in the bucket and then eat some more because they had given themselves to a culture that was started by Alexandrian society, ancient Hellenistic Greek culture that, hey, whatever feels good, do it. Then the Romans conquered Greece there's a lesson in history, by the way, that the further, the further a culture gives itself to depravity, if you study history, the further a culture gives itself to the depravity, the, the shorter the timeline gets on that culture. Anyway, Romans, they, they, they snatched some of it, but they, they wanted Pax Romana, and, uh, and you can study that too, and all this, hey, we're, we're going to do it this way. And then, and then Jesus shows up and he says, I'm not Greek or Roman, I'm here to represent the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And this is what that looks like. This is what freedom looks like. And, and, and so now Paul is writing to them, and he says something really fascinating. He said, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, because of their proximity to Israel, their proximity to Jerusalem, when that word temple shows up, every person in the Corinth church would have said, wait a second, we know the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because we've heard, every, the entire world has heard about the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Kings and queens would travel from all over the world to visit the temple. It didn't start in the temple. Give me, I mean, can I just give you a three second, 30 second? Anytime a preacher says 30 seconds, it's three minutes. But I'm going to give you 30 second. Two minutes is 20, by the way. Closing means I'm beginning to think about stopping. But if I give you a 30 second version of the journey, you got to go all the way back to Genesis. You can study this for yourself. It's a great Bible study. You go to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2. You're going to read about heaven invading the earth. God creates the heavens and the earth. And then in the earth, he creates a garden. And in that garden, he expresses the seat of his power and presence on earth as it is in heaven. But creating Adam and Eve in his own image and being in perfect fellowship with them in the garden, right? They are in perfect union and fellowship. And then something happens. Sin enters the equation. So heaven on earth gets, 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 gets. Now there's a situation where the people who are supposed to embody heaven on earth and exist with the seat of the power and the presence of God on earth as it is in heaven. A place where the earth stopped being earth and, 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 and it was neither earth earth nor heaven. It was heaven and earth. It was the two now being talked about as one. Sin shows up, and now they're shameful. That word, shame, right? We hid from you because we were afraid. We were ashamed of, of our image. And, and, and God says, who told you you were naked? And now there's a journey of sin and shame. What does God do? He, 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 he provides animal skin to cover the shame of their nakedness. Go study this for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Go look it up. Genesis 1 and 2, 3. He takes an animal and sacrifices something. And we get the beginning of a picture of sacrifice being necessary to cover the result of sin so that man can dwell in the presence of God. 
but he removes Adam and Eve from the garden. Now there's a barrier between the glory of God on earth as it is in heaven and humanity. Go study it. Now fast forward a little bit. There's a people of God called the Israelites, right? And, and they're in bondage in Egypt. And he sends Moses to, to deliver them. And remember this? And let my people go. And they, they get delivered supernaturally. And then they're out in the wilderness. And they get to the edge of the promised land. And they decide not to enter the promised land. But, but to, they, they get nervous. So, so they wander the desert for 40 years. Do you remember this? Do you remember God talking to Moses about the glory of God? He says, Lord, show me your glory. It's in, in Exodus if you want to study it. And he says, Lord, show me your glory. And he says what? You can't handle my glory. Why? Because the garden. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll cover you with my hand, and I will allow my goodness to pass before you. I'll allow my glory to pass before you, and when it has, I will remove my hand, and you can catch a glimpse of the backside of my glory. And Moses catches a glimpse of the backside of the glory of God, and he comes down from the mountain, and his face is glowing. And so God said, we got to come up with a system here. This is a very loose translation. Go read it for yourself. He says, in the wilderness, as you wander, I want you to build for me a tabernacle, a dwelling place. It's a big tent. Anybody like camping? I don't. Don't invite me. I won't go. I know, you're, I know what you're thinking, but if you went with me, I'm not going to. I love you. I'll pray for you while you go camping. I'll enjoy air conditioning and television and all the modern conveniences. God knew what he was doing when he brought me to the world. But in the tabernacle, in the desert, they needed tents. So God does something for them in the desert. My brother served military. I remember he was telling me about the desert. He was telling me that in the desert, in the Middle East, where this is taking place, at day it gets so hot that you just need shade. And at night the temperature can actually drop. He was telling me about their tents would have heaters and air conditioners, and they would have to use them in the same day because of the extreme temperature out in the desert. Now check this out. In the desert for 40 years, how does God reveal himself to his people? As a cloud by day and a fire by night. When it is hot as all get out, he covers his people with a cloud. When the temperature plummets, he shows up as a pillar of fire to keep him warm. Now, that's an expression of his presence. But he says, you can't handle the glory, so I want you to build me the tent. And inside of that tent, I want you to build me a box called the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that's going to be the seat of my power of pr and presence on earth as it is in heaven. So you need to put that in a most holy place. So inside the tabernacle, I need you to put a big curtain. And behind that curtain, I want you to put that box where my, the seat of my presence and power on earth as it is in heaven will show up. Where it will stop just being heaven and stop just being earth and the two will be become one because my presence will be there. And on a certain day, after sacrifice, after worship, after obedience to instructions, one person can crawl underneath that, tent, that curtain and can e experience the glory of God on behalf of the people. And if he makes it, he can crawl back out and tell everybody, hey, this is what God has to say. And for 40 years, they packed up that tabernacle, they moved it around, and they rebuilt it, and that was the seat of the presence and the power of God on earth as it is in heaven. Are you with me? So from Eden to the tabernacle. From the tabernacle, there comes along a guy named King David. And King David did mighty things for the Lord. He loved God. He was a friend of God. He had his issues, just like the rest of us, all in the Bible. Some serious issues. He says to the Lord, hey, I want to build you a temple. Why? Because they've moved from the wilderness to the promised land. They're not living in tents anymore. They're living in houses. He's saying, why shouldn't we build God a house? We got houses. Let's build God a house. And God kind of chuckles, I think. He doesn't say that. I just, that's how I read it. And he says, who are you that you could build me a, a house for me? He said, but you know what? I'm going to allow it. I'm going to let your son Solomon build me a temple. And Solomon builds God a temple, and it's modeled after the tabernacle, which was actually modeled after Eden. So he says, in that temple, you're going to have to put a big old curtain up. And behind that curtain is where you put the Ark of the Covenant. And all those rules that happened for 40 years in the wilderness, they're going to apply to the temple. But the temple was blinged out. The temple was like, it was bougie. It was like, it was gold everywhere. Louis Vuitton furniture. No, I'm just kidding. I just made that. I don't even know if they make furniture. But Read about it. It was extravagant. It was so opulent, people traveled from around the world just to lay eyes on it. And the people of God got really comfortable with the presence of God, even though they didn't have access to it. 
And then the Babylonians rose up and they conquered the Israelites. And then when they did so, they destroyed Solomon's temple. They took all the gold and they, melt, they burned the temple and gold melted down into the crevices and the cracks and the rocks. And they ripped the rocks apart just to get the gold. And, and, and all of a sudden, you, you, you realize that the, the, glory, the glory doesn't guarantee victory if you're not willing to live according to the process. Well, nobody could do that, right? We don't know what happened to the, the Ark of the Covenant. In all that, the Ark of the Covenant gets lost until Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, found it. I'm just kidding. That is not in the Bible. That's <laughs> I'll make sure you're still awake. All right, here we go. Almost done. You ready? Solomon's temple gets destroyed. The Israelites rebuild the temple. Later, by the time Jesus shows up, it's called Herod's temple. There's no evidence that the Ark of the Covenant was ever there. And there's no evidence that the glory of God ever showed up on earth as it is in heaven in Herod's temple. The seat of the power and the presence of God. What happened to it? Well, then there's something also, during this time, there's something called 400 years of silence. If you read your Bible, from Malachi to Matthew is one flip of one page. In history, there's 400 years where people are wondering about the seat of the presence and the power of God on earth as it is in heaven. The tabernacle's gone. The temple is empty. Where is God? And this is what I need you to understand. This is what makes these words so powerful. John chapter 1 verse 14 says this, after 400 years of silence... The Word became flesh and made his dwelling. The original language uses this word. The Word, Jesus, became flesh and tabernacled among us. Jesus became the tabernacle. Keep reading. We have seen his what? We've seen his what? The glory that Moses couldn't look at? Why? Because it was covered in an offering of skin that would be the shedding of blood. Jesus shows up with the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. What does Jesus do? Jesus becomes the seat of the power and presence of God on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus becomes a place where heaven meets earth, and you can't talk about one without the other. That's why when Jesus showed up, heaven showed up. That's why he healed the sick, because heaven doesn't have infirmity. That's why he fed, fed the hungry, because heaven has more than enough. That's why he cleansed the leopard. He accepted the broken and the outcast, because that's what the economy of heaven is like. Jesus goes to Herod's temple, and there's people in there making a bunch of money off people's shame. They're saying, oh, you did this? Well, you got to buy this offering, and you, you kill this thing, and here you go. That's going to be $22 plus the temple tax plus $19.99 for shipping and handling all those numbers were made up. Read it for yourself. But look at what Jesus does when he gets to Herod's temple and he sees how the church has turned shame into an economy. I wonder maybe if we still sometimes see that. John 2, verse 19. Jesus said to them, to, he flips the tables over. They get all mad at him. He says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. Go read John chapter 2, because they're like, it took us 48 years to build this temple. And it says he was talking about his temple. Jesus became the tabernacle, then he became the temple. And you know what he did with that temple? He allowed it to be destroyed, but on the third day he rose from the dead. But look what happened at the destruction of the temple of the body of Jesus. It says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, exactly what happened. When Jesus died on the cross, when he cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, and at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Why top to bottom? Because God didn't want man to take credit for it. Torn into what curtain? The curtain separating the Holy of Holies, the seat of the power and presence of God on earth as it is in heaven, where you can't talk about heaven without talking about earth, where you can't talk about one without the other, where they have become one. All of a sudden, the thing that separated that from the rest of the world is no longer needed. Jesus moved the seat. He moved the furniture. When you invite people to your house, do they move your furniture? No, because they didn't buy it. Jesus moved the furniture, because he paid for it. Acts chapter 2, we read this. 
that they're all gathered together in one place, waiting, as God had said, for the presence of the Spirit of God. And it says that there was suddenly, like, the blowing of a violent wind came and, uh, from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. And then what happened? This is so important. Go to the next slide for me. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And, and here it is. This, is. this is the beginning of the church. All of them were what? Filled with what? All of the disciples who had walked with Jesus and listened to Jesus and waited on the promise Jesus gave were filled with the Holy Spirit. You and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. You, if you have said yes to Jesus, you are the seat of the power and presence of God on earth as it is in heaven. You are the place where heaven and earth collide. That Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is inside of you. That's what's on the inside. That thing that people dreamed about and longed for, the thing that queens and kings would travel just to get a glimpse of, God took that. He paid the price, and now he has put it inside of everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. The reason God talks to us about our lifestyle is not to shame us in the purity, but to say to us, you've been sanctified, you've been filled, why don't you live like it? You've got power on the inside of you. Why don't you apply it? Because when you learn how to live this out, when you learn how to talk like this and think like this and live like this and walk like this and talk like this and actually get some of that on your hands and put it on somebody, the world is going to see heaven on earth. The world is going to see the glory and the goodness of God because it's expressed through your life. Shame doesn't do that. Understanding the value God has put inside of you is where that gets released. I have some notes. I left them a long time ago. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit was my second point. My last point is this. We are transformed by standing under God's truth. Standing under God's truth. Standing under. Not understanding, but standing under. I was talking to my buddy Denville. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I was talking to my buddy Denville. For those of you in the Freedom School of Ministry, you've met Denville, or you will meet Denville in an upcoming course. I think you already met him. Um, he's an incredible preacher, and he has a way of saying things. We were talking about this topic, and he said, Freddie, our issue is not understanding. We've got all the understanding we need. He said, we need to be a people who move from understanding truth to standing under truth. And I said, oh, Denville, that will preach so good. I'm going to steal it and pretend I made it up myself. No, I can't do that, though, but... And he and I are on the phone, and we spent about the next 20 minutes going back and forth talking about the difference between understanding and standing under. I understand shame, but I can stand under the presence of God. I understand guilt, but I can stand under the promise that it's already paid for. I understand I'm going to struggle, but I'm going to stand under the fact that there's victory inside of me. I understand that life is not easy but I stand under a truth that God is always with me. I understand that I've still got some, some places in my life that don't look very Holy Spirity. But I stand under the commitment to keep trying to apply it to different areas of my life. And I'm just wondering, is there a place in your life where God is challenging and inviting you to move from understanding shame to standing under the Spirit of God who dwells and abides inside of you, that it is the seat of the power and presence of God on earth as it is in heaven. And he has deposited it within his church, the people of God. And there is nowhere else on earth where we're going to find a box that contains the glory of God because he has released it into every person who is willing to call on his name and surrender to him as king and say, God, I don't have it all together. God, there's some serious rest innovation that needs to happen in my life, but I invite you. I say yes to you. And at that moment, the Spirit of God gets put inside of you. And through life, we begin to stand under the reality that as I give more of myself to Him, the world will see and understand and stand under more of His love for them. Speaking of standing, why don't we stand together? 
The thing about understanding is I can sit all day long trying to understand and I understand. I never stand. But standing under means I got to get up and I have to stand under what God has done. I have to stand in the truth of what's been provided for me. And it's a posture of being ready. The thing about standing is you're preparing. I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to invite our worship team to come up. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to be available. And at this point, we're going to enter a space where if you have allowed shame to define any area of your life, you can turn to the person next to you. You can sit down in your seat and talk to God about it, or you can go to a prayer partner if you would like someone just to pray for you. They will honor your confidentiality. They will pray with you. You can tell them as much or as little as you would like about, about what you're actually dealing with right now, but God did not bring you here to shame you. He brought you here to set you free. Jesus did not come to the cross to convince you that you're not enough. He brought you to the cross. He, went, he died on the cross to convince you that he's more than enough. I don't think we need convincing that we're not enough. I don't want to ruin what God wants to do in this moment. I'll just say very briefly, I've had people over the years say to me, Freddie, why don't you preach more about sin? I start with a basic assumption that we're all expert sinners already. And often, when I dig into that a little bit, people don't want me to preach about their sin. They want me to preach about other people's sin. I would much rather give this time in this space in this moment to preaching about the solution to sin. I've never met a person who needs help understanding that they have messed up in life. I've met countless people who need help understanding that there is deliverance from that. There's freedom from it. And it is found in the work and in the person and the spirit of the Lord. If you're here today and you're caught in a cycle of sin, may I invite you to grab onto the solution. His name is Jesus. His power is at work within you. He is for you. He will meet you. And he will transform you. But you have to choose to put the brush in the bucket. You have to choose to say, God, this is the space where I need to take what's inside of me. And I need to begin like living like it's there. And only you can do that. And if you've got some work to do this morning in terms of applying what's already inside of you, I invite you to respond to God however he nudges or leads you. We're going to worship God. We're going to have an atmosphere of reflection in here. And then after that, uh, during that, we'll have prayer time. After that, I'll come and pray over us. And then we will all together march down to the gym and buy every book in that gym. But right now, we got some work to do in here. Amen? Let me pray for us. Lord, right now, we invite your Holy Spirit to just reign and rule in this room. I pray against every distraction, whether we're online or in this space. I pray, Lord, that you show up and you do what only you could do. We invite you to have your way with each one of us. Guide us, instruct us, and teach us and show us what it means to release what's already on the inside. In Jesus' name, amen.